that was free for coming, so sorry for those of you at home. Um, <laughs> so uh, we've been tracking that theme, and each chapter in Isaiah we've talked about has somehow related back to that Yahweh is mighty in justice, righteousness, and salvation. And so uh, a couple weeks ago, I, I think it was Jordan, um, t- uh, Im- asked us to imagine a scenario in which in the 1600s, in America, if somebody suddenly proclaimed all slaves in America would be suddenly set free, and long before the Emancipation Proclamation, and that would be crazy. That would that would be wild. Uh, but that actually did happen to a woman named Harriet Tubman, and uh, Harriet said she had a vision about the end of slavery in America, uh, in the U.S. long before the Emancipation Proclamation. And so uh, reportedly she woke up from this vision from God and turned and said to her friend, my people are free. And her friend said, uh, no, they're not. Uh, And they likely won't be in our lifetime. And she was just so insistent, no, my people are free. Uh, And so when the Emancipation Proclamation actually did happen and Abraham Lincoln officially announced that, yes, all slaves in America were free, people were celebrating everyone but Harriet Tubman. And so her friend turned to her while they were celebrating and said, this is what you thought would happen. This is the vision you saw. Why, Why aren't you celebrating? And reportedly she said, I had my jubilee three years ago. I rejoiced all I could then, and I can't rejoice no more. (laughs) And so I think that is an excellent picture of how Isaiah sees Messiah. Harriet Tubman believed God would free the slaves, and she wasn't surprised when it happened. So to her, it was a done deal. Uh, And the lines between the present and the future were slightly blurred because she banked that much on that coming reality. I think that's how Isaiah saw Messiah. He banked that much on on God sending the Messiah, on that coming reality, that the lines between the present and the future and the past were a little bit blurred for him. And so that's why I think it can be slightly confusing when we read Isaiah Um, and can feel like he blurs those lines because he banked that much on God sending the Messiah. Um, I think Isaiah also saw a Messiah as God in a human body, the king who would bring peace and joy through justice. And so uh, as we see Isaiah show us that picture of Messiah throughout the book, uh, we're going to be tracking that today. So, um, oh, thank you guys are so on top of it. Um, So we're going to take some time today to look at snapshots of Messiah throughout Isaiah. Now, there are lots of mentions of Messiah in Isaiah and lots of times he appears, but we're just going to look at uh, three specific times Isaiah talks about Messiah. Um, And uh, just to kind of take a moment to pause Uh, We say that word Messiah a lot, or uh, similarly, we might uh, interchangeably use Christ. And so if you're not familiar, um, Messiah is the Hebrew word that means anointed one. Uh, And then Christ is the Greek word that means king. So both those names or titles, title is probably a better word, both those names or titles ultimately mean God's ultimate chosen and coming king. So when we say Jesus the Messiah, we're saying God's chosen one to save the world. Or when we say Jesus Christ, we're saying King Jesus. Uh, now, I mentioned to, I had a friend, uh, someone ask me a couple months ago, oh, what are you guys going through in your church series? What are you studying for church? And I said, oh, we're going to start the book of Isaiah. <laughs> and they, uh, they replied, oh my gosh, you guys must be gluttons for punishment. You're going to slog through Isaiah, really? Uh, there's, it's so confusing. There's so many different names and places. And do I need a map when to identify where all these countries are? And, and I don't understand the history. What, how do all these happen on the timeline? But most importantly, it seems like the speaker's voice, Isaiah's voice, changes so frequently, I can't keep up. Is it Isaiah talking? Is it Isaiah as a member of Israel talking? Is Isaiah recording what God says? Or is Isaiah channeling Messiah's voice? I can't keep up. Who, who's talking? And I think that's a totally reasonable question as we've been reading Isaiah. It can be really confusing on who's talking. I feel like it's very similar to Abbott and Costello's who's on first base. 
Is it Isaiah? Is it Isaiah rego- recording what God says? Is it describing Israel? Is it G- uh, Isaiah channeling Messiah's voice? I don't know. Third base. And it can, be, it can be really confusing. So I don't want you to just take my word for it this morning about these passages are about Messiah. We want to give you just a few easy, simple tips to identify Messiah. Um, that way, if, when you go back through and you know, read, uh, read Isaiah, you can identify, oh, that's probably about Messiah. Or, oh, that's probably about Messiah. Because there are lots more than just the three we're going to talk about today. So some real easy tips uh, for identifying Messiah. Uh, first, you know, Drew talked about this a lot the very first week. It's poetry. So it's very different from a story, or it's very different from information based literature like discourse or the letters, Paul's letters um, in the Bible. So chronology is not as important to Isaiah. He's not trying to uh, line out a timeline for you and say this event happened and then this event and then this event. Um, chapter twos, the, ta- the things in chapter two don't necessarily come right after chapter one uh, in that sense because chronology is not as important to him. He's writing a poem. And similarly, uh, his voice, the speaker's voice can change frequently because it's a poem. So he could be speaking in all of those voices, you know, recording God's voice, channeling Messiah's voice, speaking as himself, speaking as a member of Israel. He could be doing all of those in the same chapter, you know, not simultaneously, but at various points throughout the same chapter, he could be doing all of those. So I think the best piece of advice when reading poetry is to go with the flow, is to try and pay attention to the message or the theme that Isaiah is trying to communicate and don't get bogged down in the countries or the names or the places or when did this event happen on what date and how does that match with the other dates. Um, But just go with the flow and and take the message as Isaiah gives it. Next, I think uh, imagining what the metaphors describe. So often Isaiah doesn't explicitly use the term Messiah. He'll use a lot of other metaphors or pictures or titles to describe what Messiah is like. So, uh, for example, he has lots of examples like the branch, a holy seed, Emmanuel, a child, a green shoot, the one on David's throne, Savior, the key, the precious first building block, uh, my servant, the king, He has lots of different pictures or titles of what Messiah is going to be like and what he's going to do. And so if the metaphor describes someone who seems altogether good, like way too good to be a normal guy, uh, also slightly terrifying, then it's probably talking about Messiah. We're going to look at an example in a a minute where Isaiah says um, Messiah is like Uh, the ruler who will give justice for the poor of the earth, but strike down the wicked with a rod. And that sounds great (laughs) if you're the poor of the earth, and not so great if you're the wicked. And so imagining what the metaphor describes helps us identify, is it, does it look like Jesus? Is it talking about Messiah? Uh, Next, uh, looking for allusions or echoes to other passages. So if um, other passages refer back to Isaiah and a description of Messiah in Isaiah and say, hey, that was about Messiah or hey, that's about Jesus, then you can know that that passage is about Jesus or Messiah. Or uh, on the flip side, if Isaiah alludes to other promises of Messiah from the Old Testament or from elsewhere, um, then you can know, oh, that, that connects. That sounds exactly like the promise of Messiah in this passage. It's probably about Messiah here. Uh, and then does, does Jesus fit the bill? Does, could this person only really be Jesus? Is this a normal guy or is this probably only Jesus? Uh, and lastly, I think asking other Christians, hey, do you see what I see? Does this sound right to you? Do you see this connection anywhere else? Talking about it together. Um, we talk as a preaching team. Sometimes we can get really excited about connections we're seeing that aren't really there. <laughs> and if you ask other people, I, there was something I was talking about, Sam, I think this connects really well in here. Sam was like, yeah, I don't, I don't see that. Uh, it helps to have other people be a good sounding board and to say, no, I think you're totally right. That absolutely connects. Or mm, I need a little more proof for that. And talking about it together helps us identify Messiah in Isaiah. 
Uh, but still, at this point, you may be wondering, why are we reading Isaiah in, at Christmas? What, why are we using Isaiah f- as our Christmas text uh, for this morning? And uh, spoiler alert, Jesus is the Messiah. So Christmas is about God finally sending the Messiah, Jesus, to save the world from sin and injustice by inviting people into his new and coming kingdom uh, and to, um, to welcome them into a uh, relationship of peace. And uh, Isaiah is a listen to Christmas carols all year long kind of guy. So he has a lot to say about Messiah, about who he will be, what he will be like, what he will do. Isaiah is altogether excited about Messiah. So uh, that's why we're going to be in Isaiah this morning. And as we celebrate Jesus the Messiah, we're going to take a a look back through Isaiah to see these different snapshots of who he is and what he'll do um, and celebrate God's chosen one to save the world and why he's God's ultimate king. Uh, As we do that, there are going to be a couple different uh, key characteristics or traits uh, that pop up in every single one of these passages. And it's not just the three we're going to look at this morning. It's going to be every time Messiah occurs or we see Messiah in Isaiah, he'll have many of these similar characteristics. So as we read Isaiah, we're going to read Isaiah 7, 9, and 11. Let's uh, keep these uh, traits in mind. That Messiah is God in a human body, the king who will bring us peace and joy by judging evil and providing justice for the oppressed. We're going to see that popping up. Uh, One last note. uh, Verb tense uh, in some of these passages or others you find in Isaiah will probably be all over the place uh, because Isaiah is often praising God in advance for bringing Messiah uh, and when Messiah will come. So sometimes that will be a little bit all over the place because Isaiah is just that excited about Messiah coming. So let's dive into Isaiah 7. Oops, sorry there. Um, we're going to be uh, we're going to be asking who is who is Messiah and what will Messiah do throughout the, all these passages. So Isaiah 7. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Why will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you all a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. He will be eating curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. So as we look at this passage, uh, who is Messiah? Who is Isaiah pointing out? him to be. Uh, for right off the bat, we see that he will be miraculously born the son of God. He'll, his mom will be a virgin uh, and he'll be a son. He will not be a man's son. He'll be from God. Uh, if you're familiar with Sojourner's Truth quote about, I, I think she's referring to this passage, but uh, her quote that, uh, where did your Christ come from? Where did your Christ come from? From God and a woman. Man had nothing to do with it. Uh, that's totally true of Jesus. Man had nothing to do with it. it, was, uh, it was, he was from God. He's God's son. Uh, and then what does Messiah do? Uh, he will be Emmanuel, which is a word that means God with us, or a name that means God with us. He will uh, move in among people and live with them and live among them. I kind of wonder what Isaiah must have pictured that to be or what, how Isaiah took that when uh, God said, this is the sign, he's going to dwell among you. I think of what would it be like if a really prominent, uh, prominent, prestigious person I know moved in next door to me. Uh, and they didn't just move in next door to me on accident, but because they wanted to be my neighbor. And that's what God did. He moved in next door to people because he wanted to be their neighbor. He wanted to be close with them and with them. And he did that through Messiah. He's going to be God with us. So let's look at, uh, move on to Isaiah 8 and 9. When someone tells you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? Consult God's instruction and the testimony of warning. If anyone does not speak according to this word, they have no light of dawn. Distressed and hungry, they will roam through the land, and when they're famished, they'll become enraged, and looking upward, they'll curse their king and their God. Then they'll look towards the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom, and they'll be thrust into utter darkness." 
Okay, so this is pretty depressing. Uh, but we have to remember the situation uh, in wh which Israel is in while um, that Isaiah is addressing. Isaiah is saying, look at where you are. Uh, you are being punished by God for your sin. Um, he says the ongoing problem is that God has kicked them out of their own land because of their sins, specifically for worshiping idols. Uh, which is the spiritual equivalent of blindness, where God uses the picture here of fumbling around in the dark. He's saying, worshiping idols is as stupid as not turning the light on and just continuing to fumble around in the dark. And Israel here is grasping for any sense of control or security uh, through idols. And God says, that's not going to work. That's stupid. And so, but this is the scene in which Messiah enters uh, and comes to live among them. Uh, he goes on to say, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in darkness. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee in the of the nations by way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born, to us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So who do we see Messiah being um, in this passage? We see that he's a child, a son. And this kind of should trigger a, a memory or, or send up a red flag to us, a son, a child. Where have we been waiting for a child or a son? And it should remind us all the way back to Genesis 3 when God promises Eve a child or a son who will fix everything they broke and will, will be a son that comes and saves the world. And suddenly we should go, oh, a son, a son, a child. That sounds just like that promise of Messiah. He'll be a son, a child. He also sounds like he'll have the exact same names as God. He'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Who gets those names other than God? He'll, he'll have names that speak to his wisdom, his power, eternity, love, and he'll be a bringer of peace. And so what does uh, Isaiah say he will do? Uh, he will come into the situation where they are wandering in darkness, where they're worshiping idols and they're longing for things that bring them security, uh, but are fumbling around in the dark doing it. And he'll be a great light. He'll be a light that dawns. He'll reveal just how dark or how evil the world has been and how people have been blind to worship idols or things that give them security rather than see the one who they should worship and so God will use Messiah to shine through the darkness, open people's eyes to see who God is and how to live justly under his rule. That's fantastic. And he'll also bring joy. There's joy all over this passage. He'll increase their joy. He'll, I'm oh, sorry for the <laughs> typo there. He'll uh, increase, make them rejoice like people would rejoice at, at the harvest when, when all the harvest is brought in and it's a happy time that we have everything we need. Or he'll make them rejoice like the end of a battle at the end of a war where they've been successful and victorious and there's plunder to share. That's the type of joy people will have under Messiah's rule. And ha that joy will come from ha him defeating evil and bringing justice to oppression, breaking, I love these images, breaking the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. He'll do away with oppression. And he'll, off he'll also um, abolish war. How great would that be? He'll do away with war. And he'll do that uh, by bringing peace and by the person who's the expert in, in peace and who can alone bring peace. 
And he'll also do that by reigning on David's throne uh, forever with justice and righteousness. He'll be a king who actually can make it happen. And at the end of this passage, God says, I'm going to do it. You can count on it. You can bank on it. Let's look at Isaiah 11. Oops. Isaiah 11 says, A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. And with justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb and the leopard will lie down with the goat and the calf and the lion and the yearling together and the little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, and the young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. And the infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put its hand out into the viper's nest, and they will neither harm nor destroy on my holy mountain. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That sounds great. Uh, and again, we just have to remember uh, the Israel Isaiah is addressing and calling out to. Uh, they are conquered captives in a foreign land, or at various points in Isaiah, they are about to be conquered and taken captive to a foreign land. And God has exiled them from their land, kicked them out because of their sin. As just a, a sidebar, this is the type of imagery I think we get a lot of our Christmas carols from. These are the type of pictures and themes that Christmas carols draw on, like, O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel, who mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appears. That, that's where our, a lot of our Christmas carols come from. This idea that Israel is waiting for God to come rescue them. And with Israel, the rest of the world is waiting for God to come rescue them through the Son of God, through Messiah. So here in, in Isaiah 11 specifically, the picture Isaiah gives us of what Messiah will look like or be like is, <laughs> this is funny, a shoot, uh, a shoot out of the stump of David. Now, uh, that sounds kind of weird, but that's actually where we get this picture, the picture for our Isaiah PowerPoint. Um, it's a picture of a burned-out stump, and this little green shoot has found a way to sprout up in the middle of it. I, I love this picture. Um, I think it's a picture Isaiah is using to describe the current events going on that make it feel like life is cut down and hopeless. But he looks forward to the day that God will send his Messiah to sprout up from the ashes and rule with justice. Uh, Jesse is, uh, if you remember, Jesse's the famous King David's dad where Israel sees their monarchy starting. So to picture the legacy of King David like a burned out stump is as if to say it's pointless to hope for anyone from David's dynasty or family to save the nation. It's going to take someone who is rooted in David's legacy, but altogether new. And then we see he will delight in the fear of the Lord. And that's the one thing that kings are supposed to be, that rulers are supposed to be like. They're supposed to delight in the fear of the Lord. And remember that God is the one who sets up kings and rulers and live in fear and honor of him. And that's exactly what this king, this Messiah is going to do. That's oh, so good. Uh, what is he going to do? What is Messiah going to do? Well, we see he's going to rule justly. He's going to give justice for the poor, and he's going to slay the wicked. He's going to finally bring justice, and he will do that not by relying on his own knowledge or relying on his own experience, but he's going to do that from God's perspective. Yeah. And then he will bring peace. He'll bring peace on earth. And I think all these pictures of these domesticated animals and wild animals eating together is just a picture of the impact of Messiah's rule, where animals aren't going to eat each other. They're going to live in peace together. And if that's what animals are going to live like, imagine just how people are going to live under Messiah's rule. They're pictures of what uh, life under Messiah is going to be like. So all of these new all of these passages New Testament authors pick up on 
And they look at these New Testament or these Old Testament passages in Isaiah and they look at Jesus and they very quickly connect the dots. They see Messiah is God in a human body, the king who will bring us peace and joy by providing justice for the oppressed and judging evil. And that's the Messiah we see throughout Isaiah and New Testament authors go, oh my goodness, that's exactly what Jesus does. And so we are going to read the Christmas story this morning, um, but as we read the Christmas story, uh, let's be looking for how Jesus looks like Messiah. Does Jesus look like Messiah? Does he do the things Messiah does? So we're going to start in Luke. This obviously isn't the beginning of the Christmas story, um, but we're going to pick it up here in Luke 1. It says, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, oh, <laughs> sorry, uh, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive, thanks, and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. So as we uh, read this passage um, where New Testament authors seem to go, whoa, this guy is the Messiah. We see um, Jesus is miraculously born, the Son of God. We see when we hear, oh, he's going to be born of a virgin, that should trigger, oh my goodness, that sounds just like Isaiah 7. And go, oh, that, that, this is, we're drawing dot, connecting dots here. He's going to be... Um, He's going to be the son that we've been waiting for, the son of the Most High. He's not going to be a man's son. He's going to be the son of God. And the angel says that he's going to rule on the throne of his father, David. He's going to be a king who rules justly. And he's going to be a king that rules forever. Um, we're going to take a pause in Luke and jump to Matthew. So let's see Matthew, because Matthew sees Jesus checking additional Messiah boxes. So let's see how uh, the dots Matthew connects. It says, this is the birth, this is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She'll give birth to a son, and you're to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. So this is where we really see the name Jesus come up. You may have seen uh, this asterisk here. I am by no means um, at all uh, a Hebrew or Greek person, a uh, scholar, and so I rely heavily on the footnotes in my Bible. And so uh, I have this footnote in my Bible. You likely have it too, um, where it says Jesus is the Greek way of saying Joshua, which means Yahweh saves. That's the name for God. Yahweh saves. Uh, because Jesus will save the people from their sins. And so we see Jesus already right here, even in his name. He will be the one that brings people to peace with God. He will save them from their sins. That sounds an awful lot like Messiah. And we also see that he, he um, Matthew quotes Isaiah right here. It says, hey, that passage you read in Isaiah, definitely about Messiah, also definitely about Jesus. He will be Emmanuel, God with us. He'll be the embodiment of God's presence here on earth. All right, let's jump back to Luke. This is the actual account of Jesus' birth. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. 
He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. When they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them, they had gone into heaven. The shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And who it was, uh, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had just heard and seen and were just as they had been told. So here we have tons of angels proclaiming joy has come. Joy will come to all people because today a Savior has been born. He is the Messiah, the Lord. He'll be a baby, that child we've been waiting for uh, since with Eve. And he's going to bring peace on earth. He's going to make peace possible with people. All because of Jesus' birth. And so the New Testament authors go, ding, 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 ding. We have found him. This is the guy. Jesus is Messiah. God in a human body. The king who brings us peace and joy by judging evil and providing justice for the oppressed. That's fantastic. Woohoo! Great. Uh, but it may feel a little early in the story, like, uh, he's just a baby. He Has he actually done anything yet? Um, and none of these passages really address the justice that God sa- that Isaiah says Messiah will bring. Messiah is going to bring justice. And, and how does a baby do that? So um, if it feels a little early in the story, um, we're going to fast forward just two chapters to Jesus as an adult, starting his ministry, and Jesus addresses that right off the bat. In Luke 4, um, he is teaching uh, in synagogues. He's teaching in places all all throughout the country to people, um, teaching them about God and, and starting his ministry. And at one particular place, he pulls out Isaiah, and he unrolls the scroll of Isaiah and sa- and reads, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So Jesus, that passage is actually from Isaiah 61 that Jesus is quoting. And it's another similar passage about Messiah being God in a human body, the king who brings us peace and joy uh, by judging evil and providing justice for the oppressed. And Jesus reads that passage and he connects the dots too. And he says, this is about me. Today it's been fulfilled. It's pointing to me. He identifies all of those other passages um, are about him as well, proclaiming that Messiah has come in him. He is the Messiah. And his ministry is to proclaim that Yahweh's good news has come to earth in him. I think when, uh, Isaiah, when Jesus reads this description of Messiah, he's saying, this one and all the other ones that sound like this are about me. I am Messiah. I'm the one who's come. Uh, and when Jesus reads this passage about Messiah, he sounds great. He's going to abolish war. He's going to judge evil. He's going to provide justice. He's going to make peace the norm on earth. He's going to comfort people. Uh, oppressed and broken people. He's going to forgive sins and invite the whole world into his new kingdom, which is God's family. Um, but if you're like me, maybe you pause and go, did, did Jesus do all those things? Did, did all those happen? And, and is Jesus the Messiah? Does he fit the job description? And moreover, how is his performance review? 
Has all evil been judged uh, and dealt with? Does it feel like God's presence is here with us tangibly felt? Um, Have all oppression and war been abolished? Uh, Have all oppressed and marginalized and vulnerable or broken people uh, been given justice? Do we live in a world where peace and joy are the norm? Does it feel like the year of the Lord's favor? Um, Did Jesus do the things that Messiah said he would do? And the New Testament authors and Jesus himself say, yes, yes, he did. Uh, Or will Jesus the Messiah do those things in the future? And the Bible assures, yes, yes, he will. And I think that honestly is the tension we experience at Christmas, that Jesus the Messiah has finally come to bring total peace and joy by judging evil and providing justice. Uh, And yet that peace and joy and justice are just not fully yet. Um, And so they're not fully here. So we wait for Messiah to come again and bring peace and fully establish justice on earth. Jesus' kingdom is both here and now, but also then and not yet. Uh, He is present right now with us. And Revelation says he is also calling us to come home to himself. So I think part of Christmas is both looking back at Messiah and looking forward to his return. Christmas reminds us that we are all just like Israel. Uh, We too have an obsession with things that give us security. You know, pick your thing that makes you feel safe. And the Bible calls that an idle problem. A problem that makes us enemy with God, self-destructs our joy, uh, our relationships. It causes us to perpetuate evil on other people and allows injustice to fester in our communities. And without Jesus the Messiah, we are just like Israel. Our lives are hopeless like burned out stumps, and we're blind to uh, the empty promises of security that our idols promise. And nothing we do can bring us the hope uh, or the light or the life that we so desperately need. And so that is why God came to earth himself in Messiah. Uh, He planted his perfect seed, the Messiah, in our stump of a world uh, who burst into life and offered us uh, hope that his kingdom could actually justly rule and make peace a reality. He came to us himself to save us from our blindness, opening our eyes to see that security is only found in God. And uh, for those who ask him can have peace with God right now. He offers us justice today for the evils we've committed. Uh, And when we accept his offer, he begins to govern our lives towards righteousness from then on. Jesus is Messiah, uh, the uh, God in a human body, the king who brings us peace. uh, And by taking the punishment for our sins and begins to instill joy in us despite our circumstances. And that's exactly what Messiah does. And that is what Jesus has done for us. Now, granted, uh, Jesus has done those things for us on an individual level, uh, but Isaiah says that Messiah is going to do all of those on a worldwide scale. So Jesus' first coming, I think we can see that as a down payment of of the promise of his second coming, and that one day he will come and establish worldwide and long-lasting peace on earth, justice for systemic evil, and bring his family to live with him forever. And that's why Christmas offers us hope, not just because Jesus the Messiah came as a baby, but because Jesus the Messiah will return as king one day. So what is the best way to respond to Isaiah's pictures of Messiah or uh, to the New Testament authors connecting the dots and saying, oh my goodness, the Messiah, it's Jesus. How, what's the best way to celebrate Christmas? I think uh, first the best way is to receive Jesus' offer of peace with God. And if you've never made peace with God and you have guilt that you've tried to stuff in various hobbies or bury through various habits or ignore altogether unsuccessfully, uh, this Christmas can be the dawn of new things for you. You can receive Jesus' offer of peace with God and enjoy a trusting, secure relationship with him. You simply ask him and he will begin to rule as king in your life. That'd be great. Uh, For those of us who have asked Jesus to rule as king in our lives, he has initiated his kingdom in us. He has started to rule. And so we can praise him when we feel the benefits of his kingdom 
and also praise him when we see the need for it, when we feel the lack of it. I think part of celebrating Christmas as Christians is to praise God that the Messiah has come. Jesus is God in a human body, the God, the King who brings us peace with God and gives us joy despite our circumstances. Um, but sometimes, uh, just because Jesus rules in us as King, the rest of our world doesn't reflect that, and it can often impact us in tragic and scarring ways. So in those times, I think especially in these times, we hold on to hope that he will come again and he will bring the kingdom fully. Uh, what, what would that look like? I think uh, when we experience uh, the moments of joy or peace this year, despite cra a crazy year, despite crazy circumstances, uh, nothing that we expected, when we experience moments of joy or moments of peace in those moments. That's the work of Messiah in us. That's the work of his rule in our lives. Praise God for that. Uh, when we are deeply troubled by um, oppression or by political unrest or especially the racial oppression or divide in our country, uh, we can remember that the king will come and one day he will bring justice. He will end evil and oppression uh, and he will uh, provide peace and establish peace. Praise God. I think especially when we mourn, when we've mourned for those family members in our body that we've lost or our family members have lost family members, uh, but we hang on to hope that we will see them again. That's trusting Messiah will return. That's trusting that Messiah does heal the brokenhearted. That one day he will give us new bodies and we will all be together again. Praise God. And lastly, while we wait in the meantime, I think we take a cue from our king. We take a cue from Jesus that just like Jesus brought peace and joy and justice uh, to the world he entered, uh, we can be just like him and bring peace and joy and justice to the, to the people around us. Uh, as we've been reading, preparing, uh, observing Advent, we've been uh, reading a book um, helping us prepare emotionally for Jesus' coming, for Jesus' return. And uh, she, the author of the book, says the best way to celebrate Christmas is to be just like Jesus. So I'm going to read um, the Christmas, the, the reading for Christmas Day. Sorry, spoiler alert for those of you who are reading it. But um, I think her encouragement for us to respond to Christmas and celebrate Christmas by being just like Jesus um, is really pertinent and is really encouraging. I'm going to read that. She says, We've walked the journey of Advent from shadow into light, and now it is the dawn of Christmas tide. We celebrate that Christ is Emmanuel, God with us. He was born for all humankind as Savior to all. In our already but not yet world in which we live, what do we do now? What do we do with the knowledge that Jesus has already been born, died, and was resurrected for the redemption of the world? And, and yet we still wait in hope for the true fullness of redemption when all wrongs will be made right. What do we do? We love each other. We reveal God's love each day when we love one another. This is how we abide in Christ. We let the love of God, first fully shown to us through the miracle of Jesus' arrival celebrated on Christmas Day, pour out of us and into others. This is how we live in the shadows while celebrating the glorious light of Christ's birth. Daily love, daily confession of Christ as Messiah for the world, the light we long for during Advent is already in us because God abides in us. Let the hope, faith, joy, and peace of Christmas tide abide in you starting today as you celebrate the arrival of Christ. He is born. Alleluia. Praise God. I think as we celebrate Christmas this week, let's first receive his offer of peace with God and then praise him when we see the benefits and feel the benefits of his kingdom and still praise him and hold on to hope when we wait for him to return and set all things right. And then be the people of God uh, who are God's love embodied in human bodies bringing peace and joy to each other and the world around us by calling out evil and providing justice for the oppressed. Praise God. And closing, I want to share with you um, a Christmas carol, since a lot of our Christmas carols, I think, draw on Isaiah's imagery. This is my favorite Christmas carol, A Holy Night. You're welcome to listen with your eyes closed, or uh, you're welcome to read along with me. 
So, o oh holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morning. Fall on your knees, O oh, hear the angels' voices, O oh, night divine, O oh, night when Christ was born, O oh, night divine, O oh, night, O oh, night divine. Truly he taught us to love one another. His law is love, and his gospel is peace. Chains he shall break, for the slave is our brother, and in his name all oppression shall cease. Sweet hymns of joy in grateful chorus raise we. Let all within us praise his holy name. Christ is the Lord, all praise his name forever. His power and glory evermore proclaim. His power and glory evermore proclaim. Fall on your knees, O oh, hear the angels' voices, O oh, night divine, the night when Christ was born, O oh, night, O oh, night divine. Praise God. Let's pray. <sighs> Yahweh, you are the God who brings justice and peace and joy and has sent your Messiah to be here with us, and not just as a baby, but is continually bringing his kingdom until one day you will finish what you've started. Um, Father, thank you for giving us your spirit and for uh, not leaving us alone, um, but giving us joy and peace. Um, Father, we please uh, cause your spirit to make us look more like Jesus. And just like you sent Jesus into uh, dark places to bring light and hope, uh, we please send us to bring light and hope to people who are desperately in need of security and joy um, and use us to do the same. Father, we praise you uh, for Christmas. We praise you for the coming of Messiah, and we eagerly await his return and look forward to the day we will all be together in your kingdom. In your name we pray. Amen.